Welcome to unit two and thank you for showing up for your learning. This unit has one of the key ideas in the whole course that we're going to be using throughout the rest of the course. That is transformations of functions. Foundational. We're not getting there today. We're getting there by uh, Thursday. But today and tomorrow, we're going to be looking at complicated functions that arise when we're adding functions to functions, subtracting functions from other functions, multiplying functions by each other, or dividing functions by functions, even using functions as inputs for other functions. Now, these are complex ideas, and they create really complex algebra. And because it gets complex and becomes a workout, I want to tell you a little story about where this shows up in the world. I was speaking with my friend yesterday, and he works with a company that uh, studies power grids and the information that's generated by power grids. And he works with two big functions that are supply of electricity, which is uh, the sum of various power plants, looking at solar panels on, on people's houses, all sorts of inputs to that function. Functions within functions, a lot of them added together for supply of electricity. And then demand for electricity is another function. If the demand for electricity ever exceeds the supply, then society has big problems. We have blackouts and we lose our traffic lights and then all the then we descend into chaos after about two or three hours. Okay? So companies like his work to balance those equations and to manage things like when there's a power spike uh, in demand. For example, in the UK, when there's a football game on, meaning soccer, and it's halftime, there is a big spike in power usage at that time because many people will leave their TV set, go to the kitchen, and turn on the kettle. And the extra load of all those kettles turning on creates a big slope in the demand for electricity. And it can take power, generation, power generating plants a lot of time to ramp up their electricity production because they can't ramp up fast enough the whole system has to carry a surplus to account for any sudden power spikes now by looking at the functions that were these enormously complex additions of functions and divisions of functions by other functions to determine to predict demand in the future his company was able to turn down the dial in ohio a huge power grid in the United States by 3%. They, were, they said, we're confident that you can reduce your supply by 3% across the board with these exceptions, and you won't have any blackouts and brownouts and things like this. Industry will carry on. You don't have to restart your machines, blah, blah, blah. 3% might not sound like much. But what that did for Ohio was it's now saving that state $40 million a year and 4 million tons of carbon dioxide are not going into the atmosphere every year. So this is the efficiency that can come with improved analysis of these types of functions and working with these types of complex data. You can absolutely change the world with this type of mathematics that we're looking at here. Okay. So one of the ideas that we're going to need is this idea of equivalent expressions. All right. <laughs> So if we take a look at something like this, you want to be able to take an example like that and simplify it by collecting, expanding and collecting like terms. I'm going to go ahead and pause here, and I'm going to ask you to, um, to simplify that, and then we'll come back together. Okay, let's carry on. So if you have something that looks like this, then we agree here. We've applied the distributive property twice. We have 3x times 4x is 12x squared. 3x times negative 5 is negative 15x. And then we have another distributive property here to do. Take negative 4x, I believe, is the easier way to do this. Negative 4x, multiply it by 6 to get negative 24x. And negative 4x times negative 10x to get positive 40x squared. And then just collect your like terms. Now, I'm going to teach you a quick and dirty test to see if f of x is similar to g of x. 
okay? Algebraically, because I didn't make any mistakes, I know that f of x equals g of x. But this is a very quick test you can use to test other uh, polynomials to see if they're equivalent. And it's called the 0, 1 test. Create a quick table of values, and you're going to use 0 for x and 1 for x, and evaluate f of x at those values and evaluate g of x at those values. Let's start with 0. Okay, so if f of x is 0, uh, sorry, f at 0, okay, let's, that's going to be equal to 3 times 0 time a, times a bracket with some stuff. Okay, there's a bracket with some stuff. Plus, minus 4 times 0 and times a bracket with some stuff. There's a bracket with some stuff. Very quickly, I can see that f at 0 is equal to 0. See how I did that? Super fast? Yeah. This factor is going to be zero because of that. This factor is going to be zero because of that. Okay, so that very quickly goes to zero. If I look down here, g at zero. Let's test g at zero. So g at zero is going to be 52 multiplied by zero squared. Okay, zero squared is zero. Minus 39 times zero. g at zero is also zero. Very, very fast, very fast to do these tests, right? So I know that it's the same at zero. Now let's test for one, okay? So I'm going to go a little slower for this one, show people where it's coming from. F of X, and you, I think you can do these tests in your head, but I'm gonna write it out here. Three X multiplied by four X minus five times negative four X times six minus 10 X. Okay, now check f at 1. All right, and we're just going to sub in 1 everywhere. 3 times 1 is 3. 4 times 1 is 4, so that's 4 minus 5. Negative 4 times 1 is negative 4, times 6 minus 10 times 1 is 6 minus 10. Okay, I substituted 1 in for x in all those places. See how I did it? Yeah. See how you can do that in your head very quickly? Yeah, cool. So then let's evaluate. Uh, 4 minus 5 is minus 1, so that's minus 3, 3 times negative 1. Uh, 6 minus 10 is minus 4, so minus 4 times minus 4 is positive 16. So that gives us f at 1 is equal to 13. How many tests does that have to pass in order to get to Let's check g at 1. Oh, I just used two tests to yeah. very quick, because I can test 0 and 1 so fast. Yeah. With the zero, I'll explain in a second. Let's do g at one first. 52 times one squared minus 39 times one. Well, the advantage of using one and zero is that zero squared is zero and one squared is one. So those are really easy to do, fast to do in your head. So 52 minus 39 happens to be 13. So both of them share the same value there and there. So all this does, the 0, 1 test, is it makes us highly suspicious that f of x is the same as g of x. It's possible they're still different, but the chances of them being the same at two randomly chosen points is unlikely. We would then prove it by algebra using, using expand and simplify over there. Now, the 0 test, you just, you know, you can apply the 0 test very easily. Any term that has an x in it is equal to 0. Up here, this was equal to 0, and that was equal to 0. So it made this whole term equal to 0, and that whole term equal to 0. The whole thing was equal to 0 very quickly okay. in our heads. All right. Now, I don't want people to fuss too much over the 0, 1 test. It's my tool. I use it a lot, and I think it will save you time. Because when two equations are not equivalent, you'll find it quickly with the 0, 1 test. And it's just good practice to say, what's the value of the function at 0? What's the value of the function at 1? And you can find those quickly in your head. Let's keep going. So today we'll be looking also at simplifying rational expressions. Rational expressions might look like this, where we have polynomials divided by other polynomials. Okay. So we're using operations of functions divided by other functions to create new functions. 
So these are new are rational expressions where the numerator and or the denominator are polynomials. So let's take a look at um, what they might look like. But before we continue, we want to think about what our restrictions on the denominator might be. For example, if I have a situation where I have a polynomial x plus 3 being divided by another polynomial x minus 5. This is fine for any value of x. I can find a, a value for that polynomial except for one value of x. I am not allowed to use x is equal to what value here? x is 0 is OK. Because if I substitute, uh, let's call this f of x. If I look at f at 0, well, that would be 0 plus 3 is 3 over 0 minus 5 is minus 5. So negative 3 fifths is a valid answer. So no problem with uh, f at 0. This is OK. I'm not allowed to have f at 5. This is not allowed. Because it would create a 0 here on the denominator. This is no. Not allowed to divide by 0. We're not allowed to use a 5 as part of the domain here. So we would say x is not equal to 5 in this case. Can x be negative 3? 0 divided by something else? Sure, no problem. No problem. 0 is a valid answer. 0 on the numerator is a situation like Fisher has 0 Oreos and he wants to make sure everyone in class gets the same number. You can do that, right, Fisher? You can do it right now. Give everyone zero Oreos. Oh, thanks, Fisher. Thanks for the no cookies. Okay? But what if he's got a full sleeve of Oreos, 12 Oreos, and he wants to share them evenly among zero people? How many Oreos should each of the non-people get? Doesn't make sense. So we can't divide by zero. <laughs> Okay. Not allowed to divide by zero. It's okay to divide zero by things. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Let's take a look at this example. So let's talk about the restrictions on these rational expressions here. There is a value for x. If I call this f of x and this one g of x, okay, what is x not allowed to be in f of x? x is not allowed to be negative 2 because that would create a 0 in the numerator. Not allowed. How about for g of x, what is x not allowed to be? Well, we have the same x plus 2 factor on the bottom, so x can clearly not be minus 2. But what else can't x be? Positive 3. Positive 3 would also create a 0 factor on the bottom, Multiplying by zero would create zero on the bottom of that equation. That would not be allowed. So in this case, we have limitations on the domain, limitations on the possible inputs for those functions. We're not allowed to use x as minus 2 and not allowed to use x as 3. Notice that x is negative 1 here is OK. That just means the function would have an output of 0. 1, x is 1 here is OK. x equal 1. Okay. Yeah, x is zero is okay, but the denominator to a fraction being zero is not okay. Why? Because uh, here, um, take this stapler and please. Right now, it's in one piece. Do you agree? Put it into zero pieces for me. Impossible. If you split it, it's two pieces. What does it mean to be in zero pieces? Yeah. But the whole is one. Okay, let's keep going. So now let's talk about this example, which you have in your notes. X squared plus 2x minus 8, all divided by x minus 2. And let's simplify it. When we have a polynomial divided by another polynomial, one strategy is to factor everything that you see. So let's factor x squared plus 2x minus 8. What does that factor into? This is x squared 
plus 2x. This is a janky photocopy. Minus 8. The rest are better. Yeah, so x plus 2. Sorry, x plus 4 multiplied by x minus 2. Okay. Well, uh, we wanted numbers that multiplied to negative 8 and added to 2. Those happen to be 4 and 2. This is embarrassing. That was an easy fix. Okay. So, notice that uh, we just play our x game there. And our x game was we want to multiply to negative 8 and add to 2. And those numbers are positive 4 and negative 2. Okay. And then they go in there with the uh, x terms all over x minus 2. Okay. Now, notice that this creates a situation where, just like in the fractions we were looking at, oh, wait, no, I, we erased those over there. But just like if we had something like 24 divided by 7, and we wanted to multiply that by 12 over uh, 14, well, this is uh, pretty easy to see. This is just, um, just 4, because the 12 would cancel the factor 12 in there and just give us 2. Okay. So we cancel top and bottom. Here, the 7 will cancel that, and the 14 just leave us 2. So that's equal to 4. Okay. Here, x minus 2, whatever x is, is going to be the same as x minus 2. So x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is always going to be 1 for all values of x, except for one value of x, which we're not allowed to use. x is not allowed to be 2. So we would say that this is equal to x plus 4, but x is not allowed to be 2. Okay. Now, x plus 4, that's just a function. That's just a line. It would look like this. It would be a line that starts up there at 4 and has a slope of 1. And it just goes like that. But this line would have a little itty bitty hole right there at the value x equals 2. Okay, this would be the point 2, 6. And 2, 6, we would show that as a little hole by putting the open circle there. The open circle means exclude that point. Olivia? Wouldn't the, uh, the x minus two be x plus two? What's that? Wouldn't, like, in the bracket, the x minus two on the top of the x minus two, wouldn't that be x plus two because it's a negative two? No, it's just plus two x minus eight. No, but it's one more than the factor, right? So maybe yep. Yeah. Plus two because it's two. Uh, well, well, but you still just put the numbers from your x game into the brackets. When you're looking for what's the zeros, what are the value of the zeros? Yeah, this uh, parabola here, x plus 4, multiplied by x minus 2. Let's graph that. It would have zeros at x is equal to 2 and x is equal to negative 4. There. So it would be a parabola like this. Okay. So the value of the zeros, yes, we flip the signs. But when we put it in factored form, the, the signs from our x game stay the same. And you'll see that when you use FOIL to expand that, you will get the same thing as the standard form. And I'd encourage you to always test your answer there to, to build that understanding. In that situation, why couldn't x be 2? I don't understand that. It just isn't. Because uh, that would have created a 0 on the denominator here. But aren't we, aren't we just focusing on the, uh, where it says or x, x plus, plus four? 4? Yeah. Yeah. But this function here, this is like g of x yeah. is equal to this. A g of x is still equal to this. Yeah. But if I put in 2, then I would have a situation of a 0 divided by 0, and the universe implodes on itself. We're not allowed to so do that. You always have to be the first one. You always have to be the first one. Yeah, this, even though that factors away and these disappear because x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is equal to 1 for all values of x except for 2. Because that would have been 0 divided by 0, and that's a t-shirt that scares math teachers away. If you want math teacher repellent, put 0 over 0 on a t-shirt, and we will like cross to the other side of the street so as to not have to walk too close to you. Well, my question is, doesn't 0, if it's um, being exposed, it's well, if, I, if zero is the exponent, then that makes everything one, yes. But this isn't an exponent. This is actually a zero. 
is actually the nothing point. Well, let's keep going. So now, equivalent expressions are other things that we'll be looking at today. You're going to want to be able to look at two different functions and say, are they the same thing? I suggest using the 0, 1 test very quickly so that you can develop your suspicions, either yes or no. But then you use algebra to prove. The 0, 1 test is just a quick test. Algebra is proof. So let's take a look at what these, uh, these tests will look like. So let's see if these two functions are equivalent, okay? So, uh, oh, uh, do I want to do this example? Yes, let's do this example. I skipped it in the morning, but we'll do it today. Oh, man, it's, we're a little late. Uh, so skip this example. It's not on your page. I'll talk about it later. So uh, given the expressions f of x and g of x, we want to know if they are equal or not, okay? So I'll quickly do the 0-1 um, tests. Okay, so here's 0, here's 1, here's f of x, and here's g of x. g of x when x is 0 is 2 thirds. Can people see that straight away? If I put in 0 there for x, I'll have 2 thirds. Okay, let's try the 1 test. It's 3 quarters. Okay, see how fast the 0, 1 test is? Something like that? Super fast, right? Now let's try f of x. My 0 test would be... 0 squared minus 2 times 0 is all 0. I don't worry about it. It's just like gone, right? I, I'm not even thinking about it. x squared is 0 minus 0 is just 0. It's gone. I just have negative 8 over negative 12. 2 thirds. So see how fast, right? See how fast. That's why I like the 0, 1 test. Now let's try the 1 test, okay? In 1, I'm going to substitute 1 in here. 1 minus 2 times 1. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Minus 8, I mean negative 9, over 1 minus 1 minus 12. So f at 1 is negative 9 over negative 12. It's 3 quarters. You have to remove a factor of 3 from both of those numbers to get 3 quarters. See how fast the one, the 0, 1 test is? Are people confused by what I did, or does that kind of make sense? That's just a test that you can't just... It's a quick test. It makes me highly suspicious that, yes, these two functions are very likely the same. Very likely to be the same. Now we use algebra to prove it. The advantage of doing that test is because it probably takes you 10 seconds. It's good mental math practice. And if they're not the same, it proves they're not the same. If they are the same, you're now highly suspicious, you do your algebra. Your algebra will take longer. Okay, f of x. Factor the numerator, factor the denominator. x squared minus 2x minus 8 factors into what? Yeah. So that's what the numerator factors into. And the denominator multiplies to negative 12, adds to negative 1. Yeah, x minus 4 times x plus 3. Am I going fast now? Yeah. Okay. Factor your trinomials. Zoe? They're equal at 0 and they're equal at 1. It means they're highly likely to be the same thing, but we haven't necessarily proven it yet. This will prove it. Now notice that we have the same binomial factor on the top and bottom there. The x minus 4 is going to be the same as x minus 4 for every value of x, except for one value. And then we're left with what? x plus 2 divided by x plus 3, and that was g of x. So what this shows is that f of x is equal to g of x when x is not equal to negative 3, because that will create a 0 there or there, or 4, because that will create about a, a 0 there. Even though this has been canceled away by our factor magic, 
it still provides a limitation to the domain. And we want to record this in this way. Because here f of x is just equal to x plus 2 divided by x plus 3. That's the only thing that wasn't factored away. That was what we had over here as g of x. See why they're equivalent, Livia? Yes. The 4? Oh, x minus 4 divided by x minus 4 is 1 for all values of x except for 4. Because 4 minus 4 is 0. And I do not want a 0 on the denominator of my fraction. Never allowed. Not to divide by 0. Not allowed. Too many memes. Yes. Too many memes about that. So try these questions, and we'll take up our tests later this week. If you're still writing your test or you haven't written your test yet, please come see me at lunch tomorrow or Thursday or after school someday by appointment, and I can get you time to either finish your test or start the test and then finish it. If you're not done your test by the end of the week, you'll have to write a different test because the tests are going to get handed back on Friday. Cool? All right, I hope it's cool. Any questions, hit me up by email, and uh, otherwise, bring me over to your desks. Bye!